guys, Rob Tebbett here. Delighted to be joined for the first time, might I add, by Trey Chaney, musician, actor, dancer <laughs> once upon a time ago, and of course, former star of The Wire. I'm joined by Poot. How are you, Trey? I'm doing great, Rob, man. I'm honored to be on here with you, man. Thank you for having me, brother. But the honor is absolutely all mine. Um, everybody who will be watching this will know that I'm an enormous fan of The Wire. I'm very, very grateful yeah. to have you here, particularly in a very, very busy time for you, even though the world is kind of in a very precarious position at the minute. You are still working. You're currently shooting a movie. So before we start yeah. talking about years gone by, let's, tell, let's talk a little bit about what you're up to at the minute. Tell us about the movie that you're shooting. Yeah, man. It's this new film, man, that I'm shooting called Out on a Limb. And it's uh it's produced by uh Okarike and uh Regina Okarike and um a good brother uh shot by shot imagery and and I'm I'm just real honored to be a part of it. I played this character named Nephew. It's um this guy who's who's just out of control in the streets, man. Got a lot of stuff going on in the streets and and you know it's it's starring a, a good friend of mine, man, Jamal Willard, who played Notorious in the B.I.G. movie. And um, yeah, man, we're just out here in Atlanta. Atlanta is where I currently, you know, reside and in, in, in we're just out here filming that. Um, I'm having a great time filming it, man. I just finished my own project that I just produced, um, co-directed and starting called Truthless. And um, I'm introducing this character called Omar Green, AKA OG, who's gonna be, he's, he's gonna be a, a character to remember. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to give people, people always refer to me, of course, I'll never be able to escape poop from the wire, right? So with me producing my own shorts, I'm like, okay, look, I know people want to see the street side of me as an actor. So I, I'm intro I introduced this character, Omar Green, and you know, it, it, it'll be out next week. And um, I'm just, I'm, I'm real honored, man, to still be working. You know what I'm saying? And of course, Saints and Sinners, you know, Saints and Sinners is Bounce TV's number one show. I played the character Kendrick on there and um you know that's premiering on bounce tv this spring so i've just been able to man just stay afloat and, and continue to grind it out and just continue to work let's just talk about that because um there may be people who are watching this who aren't familiar with the fact that once upon a time i used to be something of a very very low level actor um i, <laughs> I understand the uh, the kind of the precarious nature and the uncertainty of being a jobbing actor as we call it over here um, how was the pandemic impacted on that in the last 12 to 18, well, 12 months for you? Well, you know, it, it's definitely, you know, being on set in, in these times, you know, like it's, it, we have to take the, the right safety precautions. You know, we, we have to follow the safety guidelines, the rules, man. And that requires taking a COVID test at least three to four times a week. You know, that's the only way that we're able to work, you know, on any set. You know, whether it's Atlanta, whether it's Hollywood or wherever, you know, wherever you're shooting, you know, uh, taking the COVID-19 test is required. So that's been like the biggest adjustment. I remember when I first took a COVID test where they had to do the swab in, in my nose and I was so nervous, man. But at the same time, once I got it done, I think it's the thought that scares people more than actually getting it done because it wasn't that painful. It wasn't bad. And just to be on a set and feel safe, knowing that everybody around you was tested, everybody came up negative, it, you know, that's a great feeling, you know? So that's been, you know, probably the biggest only adjustment. And of course, wearing your mask everywhere you go, you know what I'm saying? Um, even while we're on set in between takes, if we're not in hair and makeup, you, you have to make sure that that mask is on, you know? So, um, yeah, man, that's been that's that's been the adjustment, you know, just adjusting to COVID-19 and all the all the procedures that come with it, all the safety guidelines. I was just about to say that when you were saying about masks all the time, I wondered how hair and makeup might feel about that in between takes. Well, we do have the um the the shield, you know, the shield that they put on or whatever. So it's not actually covering covering our face. So it's, it is the shield. And uh, yeah, it, it's you know, it. it long as everybody's being safe that's like the that's like the main thing that is the concern you know on set everybody's concerned about okay did they take the covid test do they have their mask um you know in between takes are they are they going to be in their trailers while this group of people over here might be shooting i mean 
from the whole cast and crew, everything that I've worked on from the time that I started working again, late 2020, uh, it's it's been, you know, through those safety guidelines. Before we um before we move on and go right the way back, um, let's just talk about Truthless. You you mentioned it at the start of the interview, something that you've you've worked on yourself. It's very much your project, yeah. and you're releasing it next week. How do we yeah. see that, and what have we got to look forward to in that? So, um, first of all, man, I got to shout out my team. I mean, my my own company, Cheney Vision Entertainment. You know, I I formed the company last year because I just said, you know, having the experience of being on different sets and understanding certain things. I don't know everything, but I understand, you know, certain things as far as, you know, directing, uh, producing, you know, um, I got my editors, shout out to Mars 3045, um, my sister, Dr. Sean Powell from Powerful Productions and Robin Jones from Colossal Productions. We came together and um, it was presented to me, you know, to come to Jacksonville, Florida, which is uh, where Dr. Powell and uh, Mars 3045 is from. And, you know, going out there, I, I can't, we came, we all came up collectively with this idea to shoot my first short film and shooting this short, my first short film, Truthless, you know, I wanted to co-direct it. I wanted to produce it. I wanted to cast it. I wanted to star in it. And like I said, man, we, we actually shot Truthless in one day, 18 hours, 18 to 20 hours. It's a 17 minute short film. We shot it in one day and um, it'll be premiering on Amazon Prime next week. You know, so, uh, huh? What date? Uh, uh, January 19th. Yep, January 19th, Amazon Prime. Truthless will be premiering. It's starring myself, um, a good friend of mine, Richard Young Rob Brown, Todd J. Phillips, Miss Diamond Duval, uh, Leroy Gordon. Um, so many different people, man. Uh, it's so many people to name, but um, I'm, I'm just really, I'm, I'm, I'm really honored that I was able to, uh, during the pandemic, you know, like you said, following those safety guidelines, I was able to still create, you know, my own short film. This is the first short film from Trey Cheney, you know, and, I, and I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm happy, man. I can't wait for everybody to see it because this character, Omar Green is crazy. You know, so yeah, y'all y'all are in for a, a crazy ride with it with this guy. Well, just listening to you talk about it and how excited you are has made me very, very excited to see it myself. I would have watched it anyway because I'm a huge fan yeah. of the wire and of course of your work. So um everybody else, if you're watching this, truthless, Amazon Prime, January 19th. You heard the man, you've got to watch yeah. it now. Go yeah. and see Trey Cheney's first short film. So, Trey, let's go right the way back. As I mentioned, <laughs> um I have a very, very, very small history as a as a very low level performer. Once upon a time ago, talk to me about you first getting into performing. As I understand it, you started off as a dancer. Once upon a time, <laughs> yeah, man, I was eight years old. Um, I'll never forget. You know, my parents always supported me. I'm originally from Forestville, Maryland, Washington D.C., and they used to enter me into talent shows because I really thought back in the day I was Michael Jackson, MC Hammer. I thought I was all of these different guys it, it put in one body, you know, and um, I just used to dance, man. I used to could look at, you know, television. That used to, I still can dance, but I, I, used, I would look at television and just study, you know, some of the greats. Like I said, you know, Michael Jackson, MC Hammer, Bobby Brown, James Brown. I, I would study these guys and I would just mimic almost like everything that they did as far as dancing. And I started um, performing at, you know, Showtime at the Apollo. Actually, it was it was amateur night back then because I was too young. But um, I started entering these shows, man. I was winning first place, thousand dollars every time I won. You know, so I won over eight times. So you do the math on that. As an eight year old kid, I was getting a couple dollars back then. So um, you know, the dancing continued along with me incorporating hip hop music, rapping, which is what I do now. Um, for a number of years, I want to say over 10 years, from eight years old to maybe about 18. And then I was discovered in DC by a lady named Linda Townsend. And she said, I don't represent dancers or hip hop artists, but I represent actors. And I think since you don't have any type of stage fright, you're not afraid, you're not shy to get on stage and perform. I want to represent you as an actor. I think you could pull this off. So um, to make a long story short, I signed with Linda Townsend, I want to say back in 
99, 2000. And uh, my first audition ever in 2001 was The Wire. That was my first audition ever. The first time I had ever read a script, monologue. I always had a great memory. I knew how to remember lines because I write music. So, you know, memorizing lines and, you know, monologues, that was that was easy to me because I said, I'm, I'm already used to looking at a piece of paper, looking at some words and, you know, reciting them right back without looking at the paper, remembering. So, um, yeah, man, it was, I mean, we, we're talking what, like 19 years later, <laughs> you know, the, the wire, I re, I'll never forget that first audition. You know, it was with Pat Moran, uh, Pat Moran and Associates out there in Baltimore. And um, I actually initially, read for we bay you know <laughs> i read for we bay and um i never forget i walked in i was nervous i didn't know what the slate was i didn't know how to turn to the side so she can get a profile i didn't know any of that <laughs> and she said um i could tell that you never did this before but i see something i see something in you now read the monologue so i read the monologue for we bay i remember getting a call back and for any actors or actresses out there anybody in production that's not familiar with what a callback is. It's when the casting directors, directors, they want to see you because they have a feeling that you might be right for the part. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the role, but you might be right for this part. So um, I go back and when I walk in, David Simon is in there, uh, you know, the creator, uh, Robert Cosbury, Nina Noble, Clark Johnson, um, all these amazing people, you know, just from HBO. And I'm like, all right, so I go in there, I recite the monologue for We Bay, and I fumbled a little bit on the words. And I told them, I said, I'm sorry, I, I, this is my first time doing it. And they were like, all right, that's cool. They said, this time, don't mess up. You know, so that type of pressure, you know, um, looking back on that now, that was, that, was that, that was that type of pressure that they were already, you know, training me for you know, to be in this business for such a long time, still being able to do what I do, you know, when that, when they say don't mess up, that's like, okay, it's time to get it, you know, it's time, it's time to do it, if this is what you do, then do it, you know, and um, I never forget, man, through the grace of God, I recited those lines, and I left, and two weeks later, I was getting a call back, uh, my agent at the time, Linda Townsend, she said, they didn't cast you for WeeBay, but they created this character named Malik Poot Car. So they casted you for Poot. And I was literally, Rob, I was only supposed to do the first episode in the first season and end up doing all of the episodes in season one, then a couple of episodes in season two, then more episodes in three, four, end up making it all the way to the end of The Wire, one of the last men standing, all five seasons, um, a part of history, you know what I'm saying? A part of history, indeed. You, know, you touched upon it there. I mean, we're we're almost 20 years later, and and the wire still receives such a. It, it, I watched a documentary once where it tried to explain kind of the fandom that The Wire has. It's different to any other TV show, I feel, as a, as a yeah. huge fan of The Wire. What do you think it is about The Wire that, that creates this, let's call it what it is, a cult following that it, that it still enjoys almost 20 years later? Um, for me, The, the Wire was, when, when you hear the term reality show, like when you hear that term right now, you know, people have a certain view how they look at reality TV. But The Wire, I always say this when I speak to people, The Wire was literally the first reality type of television show. And the reason why I say that is because anything that you could think of that people can relate to, that's why The Wire has such a cult following right now. You know, it wasn't... It, it definitely, we shot it in Baltimore. We shot it in Baltimore and everything that you've seen was the reality of what was really going on in Baltimore. But the reason why so many other people around the world in different cities, in different states, different parts of the country could relate because it was their reality. They were watching it saying, okay, everything that these characters are doing in, in Baltimore city right now, this is, this is what we can relate to in Washington, DC. 
which is where I'm from, Fullsville, Maryland, Chicago, London, uh, Florida, Houston. I mean, at any where you could think of New York, Atlanta, any any place around the world you could think of could relate to some of the things or majority of all the things, all the subject matters that the wire touched on. And one of the things that I, that me as a fan, or say a fan, a super fan of the wire would, would say <laughs> that looking back on is, is one of the things that kind of brought me into the wire and has, has, has allowed it to, to keep the special place in my, in my life really years and years later is the fact yeah. that, it allows you to see that not all good guys do good things, not all bad guys do bad things. And it kind of shows you that gray area and the fact that just because somebody is a, a bad guy, a drug dealer, it doesn't mean they're incapable of, of, of good things, of, of empathy, etc. And likewise, it doesn't mean that if you're a cop and you have a nice shiny badge, that makes you automatically a good guy. Is that something that you yeah. resonate with? Yeah, you hit it right on the nose. You know what I'm saying? It just, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, the characters in The Wire, what, what we portrayed was nobody's perfect. You know, regardless of how good you try to be, you're still not perfect. You still, life happens, you know, different things in your life come up, you know, different changes, adjust adjustments, different things have to be adjusted, you know. So, so I think, like I said, The Wire just touched on so many different facets of life. That um that the whole entire world could just relate to and and like you said, man, um it 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 brought out, you know, a lot of times people look at themselves in those characters, you know, in some type of way. Just going back, um, you touched on it briefly there about how supportive your parents were. Again, you know, from my own experience, having kind of supportive family when when you want to go into something that is quite an unsteady living and and quite a, an unsure way of earning a buck. Um, having a that support base behind you is always something that is is really worth its weight in gold. How important was that for you to have that? Well, you know, shout out to my mom and dad, Skippy Lane Cheney. Um, wow, you know, just just being a hundred percent supportive over my entire career. You know, starting off in the business as a dancer, all the way up until now. You know, over twenty five, thirty years later of still being doing what I said I was going to do at seven, eight years old, I'm still doing it, you know? So just having that support system, one thing that I can honestly say for parents out there, when you, when you put that love on your kids, they will, you know, they, your expectations for them, they will pass and exceed the expectations that you even have for them because you show that love and support. And that's one thing that my mom and dad, Skippy Lane, did. And I can't, you know, leave out my sister, Candace Cheney. You know, she's, it was always me, mom, dad, and my sister. You know, so so that was, my family is 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 very, very important. They, they, they play and they continue to play a very important part in, in my life. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, like, like I said, man, just, you know, putting that love on me back then as a kid. All the way up into now, you know, I mean, still supporting everything that I put out. My father is my biggest fan, like my dad. He's Skip Cheney is my <laughs> that's my that's my biggest fan. I mean, my whole family is, but my my mom and dad, man, and, and my sister, they really, they really, you know, they really was there all these years. And my aunt Petey, you know what I'm saying? I gotta give it up for my aunt Petey Maria Knight and, and my uncle Jimmy. James Cheney, you know, it's it just my whole family, man, was just always in my corner. And that's what makes me who I am today. You know, I've been married to my wife, Aisha, for 16 years. Yeah, I've been married for 16 years. We have two amazing kids. My son, Malachi, is 14. And our daughter, uh, Martina, is uh, 28. You know, and, and now we have a granddaughter, Morocco, who's, who's eight months. You know, so everything about me always started with family, you know, nothing ever came before that. And I think I feel, um, you know, that's where all my blessings come from, you know, because I, I got this, I got a set way when it comes to, you know, having my family around me and, and, and definitely, you know, just pushing forward. And they, like I said, everybody's, they, they're a hundred percent behind what I'm doing. Poot the grandfather, we're all getting old. 
<laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's so crazy, man. Like to see my daughter. You know, I actually when I met when I met Aisha, when I met my wife over, you know, 17, 18 years ago, I met my eight-year-old daughter. You know, uh, she was eight at the time. And and I just remember, you know, regardless of the circumstances that she may have been going through with her biological father, you know, me as a man, as a as a black man, I was gonna step up. You know, um, my vow wasn't just, you know, to my wife. I made a vow also to my daughter to never ever consider me her stepfather. I made a step up as a responsible man and and like I said, man, just just playing a part in raising her since she was eight years old all the way up to see her now, you know, to see Martina at 28 and my granddaughter now is eight months, you know, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Like, I'm like, yo, look at this, you know, look at this, look, look at what was created through all of these years. You know what I'm saying? Look at, you know, all of the, all of the, all of the work, all of the time, all of the energy that was putting in, all of the love that was put in. Look at this. This is beautiful. You know, <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, I'm, I'm a young parent myself. And, you know, just just to hear you talk about that really, you know, it really touches me as a parent. Um, You mentioned your daughter's 28. Your son is 14. What's it like when you, what was it like when your son started to learn about how your his father was in, in, well, in my <laughs> opinion, it's my interview. So in the greatest TV show of all time, how is that? You know what? It, it's 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 funny, man, for my son, because, um, you know, from the from the time my son was born in in 2006 june 1st 2006 that's when malachi cheney was born and um i just I, i've always had him around the business you know malachi was in my first video fatherhood when he was i wanted to say four or five years old um i've always had him around me in the business he's always seen certain things but you know the older he started to get when he really started to understand who his dad was, you know, when we go out, I'm signing autographs at the mall, or at the gas station, at the, at the convenience store, you know, I'm, I mean, so he's like, oh, what, you know, all of these people are, what do you, you know, and I actually showed him some of the episodes from The Wire. And of course, he's a huge fan of Michael B. Jordan, <laughs> you know, Idris Elba, you know, like, you know, so, so some of these people that I get to work with, and, and I personally know, he's like, oh, wow, do you, you're with deep, and I'm like, yeah, you know, these are these are these are guys who, you know, who I who I started out with, you know, in, in the beginning of my career, and um, yeah, man, he he is, he accepts it now, you know, because he's because now he's a little older and he knows. But one thing about him, he does have his own identity. He doesn't want to be an actor. He's mm -hmm. like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm I want to play football. I'm I'm into sports. Um. I'm, I'm into my video games. You know, he's we're, we're totally different in that aspect of career. And one thing I always said was I never was going to force what I do as far as entertainment on my kids. You know, it, it's almost like let them have their own identity. You know, I knew what I wanted to be when my teacher asked me at eight years old, Trey Chang, what do you want to do? I want to be a hip hop artist. I want to be an actor. I want to be in the entertainment business. I firmly knew what I wanted to be at eight years old. So right now, you know, I'm, I'm 39, you know, uh, and I've, I've been doing what I said I was going to do since eight. So it's, you know, it's almost looking at Malachi now at 14, where he wants to go in life. You know, he's, we're, 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 we're all in this figuring out stage right now, you know, so he's, he's doing well, man. He's a great kid. And like my daughter, you know, her being a mother, at 28 she's a great woman you know she's she's a great great mother and um yeah you know that that's where we at with it now you mentioned kind of having that so clearly in your mind when you were just a kid and you've obviously gone on to achieve great things in various different fields within performing arts but you know we all know that the industry as we've mentioned uh, on several instances it has its own ways of sometimes making your life difficult sometimes work isn't always yeah. available sometimes yeah. it's not the right work etc have there ever been any times in those 31 years since you were eight years old where you even considered doing something else to be honest with you um i've never considered doing anything else uh for me at an early age i was always attached to the process 
without getting emotionally attached to the end result. You know, I was always attached to the process of grinding and hustling for what I want and turning nothing into something. You know, it's, it's almost like, okay, when The Wire ended in 2008, I didn't get work, mainstream work as people consider, like I'm on Saints and Sinners now into 2015. So that was seven years of that those thoughts could have could have came up. But what I did was the process of me uh, of using The Wire as a stepping stone saying, okay, I'm known all across the country. People know who Poop is, right? So I'm going to use that to start creating my own. So I wrote a book, the book, The Truth You Can't Betray, uh, which is on Amazon now. I started touring schools. I started performing music, educational music to uplift kids. I, uh, a lot of speaking engagements. Then a couple of films that I was casted for on an independent level, I started teaming up with other filmmakers, writers, producers. Because see, people, people don't understand as an actor, you don't necessarily have to be on a huge show or in a huge production to say, I'm an actor. You know, acting is auditioning. Acting is reading. Acting is, you know, eating the right healthy food so you can make sure that you stay fit and trim for, for the next role. Acting is so many different forms of being an actor. It's not just about being on The Wire or Saints and Sinners or Dropping Truthless on Amazon Prime. If, if you want to be an actor, read up on it. You know, read up on acting. We got the internet. We got the most powerful tool in the world. Study, study different monologues, you know, create. You can create your own short films or your, your videos, you know. So, so I always knew back then what, what that was. And, and, and I'm gonna be honest, I was fortunate. I was very fortunate to understand that, okay, I might not be on a hit show forever. So what am I going to do in between? I always was ready for that. And that's why to this day, it, it was never a time I can honestly say in 31 years that I ever thought about doing anything else. And and, and this is this is going to be what it is until the, the day I'm no longer here to do it. I'll still be here. My my energy is still be on this earth, but you know, God forbid if something was to happen and and I, I had to I had to go. You're going to remember Trey Chaney as the actor, the artist, the motivational speaker, the husband, the father, you know, the brother, the son. I mean, you're going to remember, you're going to remember the, the legacy. You're going to remember the legacy. I'm going to make sure of that. You make an interesting point, though. You mentioned about when The Wire finished and, and kind of going from there. And it was seven years before you were able to kind of get something of a similar ilk or to get something else to get your teeth into on that kind of level. Was there ever a time where, I mean, you mentioned there, I mean, we've done in, in this interview, um, you know, you are poop from The Wire to an awful lot of people around the world. Was there ever a time that you that you resented that or every time that you wanted to step away from that and avoid being typecast? Did it ever frustrate you? Well, well, for me, um, that's definitely something that it, I was never frustrated, but I did understand playing this character was, was, was really going to bring those type of roles only for a long time. And it's still kind of, I'm like on the cuff and in between of, you know, I want to play a teacher, but the cast director might say, no, you play a good drug dealer. You play the guy that can hold the gun and shoot somebody, you know? So I'm still trying to trying to kind of like get into more of the positive roles. But at the same time, it's almost like it's a compliment. Like you, you played that role so well. We want to see you do that again in this. And, and then that translates to work, you know? So it, for me, man, I, I do, I do struggle with that a little bit, you know, trying to, to, to get out of the, the, the drug dealing negative roles and, and do more positive things like play a doctor, play a lawyer, play a husband, play a father, play the, play the people that I am, you know, in real life. But at the same time, you know, I still say, okay, it's still work to be done. You know, it's still, it's still that breaking, breaking out role, you know, because people still look at me to this day and say, your breakout role was the wire. And, and that's it. You know, people say, yeah, that was, that's your role. That's, that's what we see you playing. 
but I, but I'm, you know, I'm multi talented on the acting level. I want to play different roles. So yeah, that to answer that question, Rob, that is something that I, that I struggle with. I'm trying to, you know, break into the what they consider like that, you know, like I said, that teacher, that doctor, that that lawyer type of role. And it's also, um, you know, as a performer and as a as an actor, you want to challenge yourself. You want to tap into different parts of who you are as a person, and you know, put yourself into the mindset of a somebody who has uh, OCD, somebody who may have a like, you know, somebody completely removed from where you are. And it's something that you want to do yeah. to really, you know, to challenge yourself, but also to keep yourself stimulated. I guess. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's definitely where I'm at right now. That's definitely where I'm at right now. Just just taking on different different roles. My agent, um, Joy Purvis, is sending me out a lot on auditions. You know, we're we're, we're doing a bunch of auditions. That's why I said with, with acting, all of the all the everything that we're doing now is, is just it's it's the foundation being laid. You know, it's a part of the work. And and my thing is, you know, for people out there listening, man, when you keep doing something, when you keep at it, and and, and you're really passionate about it, and you see yourself. Uh, being in these type of roles, eventually all of that stuff will manifest for you right before your eyes. Yeah, that's what that's how I look at it. That's a very healthy attitude to have. I mean, you, as I say, you, I'm going to keep banging on about it. You've, you know, you've been in the greatest TV show of all time, yet you look at that as merely your start point, your entry into doing what you want to do, and not the not by any stretch the kind of the end the end of the journey and, and i think that's a very healthy attitude to have and not necessarily just for actors obviously I, I i deal with a lot of fighters and boxers who you know will will achieve their goal and then as soon as they achieve their goal they immediately go down because they don't have anything else to work for i think it's very healthy for for us in life no matter what walk of life that you're into to continue to set different goals and continue to try and better yourself in various different ways that's true that's true i definitely agree with that Okay, so back to The Wire. Desperate to talk about The Wire. Do you remember your first day on set? Um, Yeah, I, I remember the first day on set. I didn't know what, what, it, what the trailer and all of that was. I didn't know what craft services was. I didn't know that somebody comes up and says, hey, uh, you, you're here. Um, I'm getting ready to take you to your trailer. Oh, you're going to hair and makeup. I didn't know what any, I, didn't, I, I was clueless. I didn't know anything. And um, that gradually just came. I had to learn, you know, wardrobe and I, I had to learn. I learned so much, man. I learned so much from the behind the scenes that went on on the wire. It was one thing, you know, just showing up saying, all right, I got my lines down, Pat. I learned from the wire. I'm going to be honest with you. The wire, I learned work ethic. I learned you could get on set at 6 a.m. sometimes and not rap until 1, 2 in the morning. I, I learned, I knew what that, I, I, I knew what that was, you know, so it's so many things that I can credit the wire on just being education for me, you know, learning, learning the different things that go on, you know, knowing the hair and makeup, they continuity, you know, being on set. If my, if my hood is this way, it got to be on there for the whole entire time that way, you know, because it's, it's, it's certain things that, that you look at and you say, this is how it's supposed to look. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, man, my, my first day was a trip. It was a trip, man. I was really like, yo, how, wh how does this work? I'll never forget asking Larry Gillier who played D'Angelo. He was my go-to guy. I would ask him, I would ask him a million questions and he was just so patient with me. He was so patient in, in telling me everything. Cause you know, when you get on set with people like Wood Harris who played Avon, Wendell Pierce who played Bunk, when you get on set with these guys who've been in the business for a long time and I'm new, you know, these guys just embrace me, man. They embrace me like, yo, whatever you need to know, we will tell you, you know, we'll, we'll ask any questions you want. And I, and, 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 and still to this day, um, you know, to see guys like that, give me compliments for some of the work that I'm doing now in television and film and music. You know, to hear them say, Trey, I remember when you first started, you didn't you didn't know what this was or that was. And now you're running your own company, you know, Cheney Vision Entertainment. You're, you're shooting your own films and you're you're hiring your own crew. And I mean, all of the, all, all of these moments for me are, are full circle moments, man. Full circle moments that I, I never take for granted. I'm so humble, so grateful and thankful by everything that's just 
that, 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 that transpired after the show ended. Like you said, Rob, we're, we're looking at each other, man. This is, I never thought I would be talking about The Wire 19 years later. I, I just, I just didn't. I didn't, I mean, I knew we was a part of something special, but I didn't know that 19, 20 years later, I would be sitting here speaking about the show, you know, with, with you. <laughs> Somebody who, who reached out and said, yo, I'm a, I'm a fan of the show. And, you know, now you, you doing your thing, you got your platform and, and I'm able to come on here and we're able to talk, you know, about, about groundbreaking experiences, you know? Going back to um, what you said there about developing in the wire and, and having a, a Larry Gilliard and having other people around you to help you. It's also worth pointing out that like a Michael B. Jordan, even Idris Elba, the wire really was the 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 start of maybe not the start but certainly the launch pad for their careers what does that say about first of all the wire in general and also those actors who who really made their bones doing it well it was um you know we can't do nothing but be thankful and grateful for the wire the wire was was definitely what put a lot of us on the map map when i say that i mean yeah, even if we did things before then, I know I didn't, but you know, other actors that you name, Michael B. Jordan, Idris Elba, you know, if they were doing things before then, people, people knew them from the wire once that once that aired. You know, I mean, the the worst, one of the one, the most terrible scene for me and JD Williams was of course killing Michael B. Jordan's character, you know, killing Wallace off the show. I mean, but people, people. You know, they 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 gravitated to him. You know, that scene, they felt bad for him on that scene. You know, so I mean, I, that was a that was a very how highlight moment on the show for for our careers. You know what I'm saying? And just to just to be, you know, like I said, still I still get I I still get jobs off of people saying poop from the wire. Oh yeah, I'm gonna hire you on my my new film. You know, I mean, which is a which is a plus, you know, I mean, thank God I take the craft series and I show up and know my lines, you know, because some of it, some of this is, you know, just just the real the wire created relationships, longevity relationships that I still got to this day. People that I still been doing business with since I started on the wire, still having that business relationship with them to this day. You know, so that's what the that's what the wire created. It created you know, a long lasting, I mean, just think, me and you talking right now, you're gonna have millions of people looking at this interview. Out of those millions of people, Wire fans, uh, directors, writers, producers, even you saying that you were an actor or that you're, you're an actor, man, you might be working together soon on a movie. You never know, man. That's what The Wire did. That's what The Wire is doing now. I already feel the energy. Well, if we could do something in the future, that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, that would that would be great. Um, just going back on what you said there, I mean, let, let's touch upon it now. One of, I mean, The Wire has some pretty heart-wrenching moments throughout all five seasons. Um, yeah. not, none, in my opinion, more heart-wrenching than, um, than season one, where yourself and J.D. Williams, who of course plays Bodie Broadus, um, kill michael b jordan wallace where's wallace um how difficult yeah. was that for you obviously you've, well first of all i want to know when you knew that was going to happen when did you know that that was going to happen um they had a thing where and to this day like most shows that, that i know of that i've been on in movies they have a thing where they when they, when they give you the script you kind of find everything out right then and there it's not like a preparation for knowing what's going to happen. Like, you know, scenes, say if I got the script on Wednesday and they say, okay, Friday, this is what you're shooting. That's how I found out, you know? And I think it was a shock to everybody. Everybody found out that way about that scene. So it was almost like, whoa, like it, it, it was tough because, you know, we, we, we all as actors on set, if you're spending so, a certain amount of time together, months together, you know, you develop a, a, a genuine, serious relationship, a cool relationship, a brotherhood that um, is off screen. So it was, uh, you know, Michael B. Jordan, we always knew he was, knew he was a special, f 
phenomenal actor, but he, he's also a great person. You know what I'm saying? Off screen. Take acting out of the equation. He's a good guy. You know, I know, you know, I, I knew his family, his mom, his, his dad, his sister, his brother, you know, they, they're a great family, you know, so you establish a relationship with them. And then we get this, we get to the scene where we got to, you know, kill, kill his character off. So that means, you know, when this character get killed, killed off working in Hollywood and working jobs, that means he, you know, he's out of a job. You got to find another job now. You got to find another TV show or another movie. So I think a part of those emotions were in it. And then for me, a friend of mine, you know, back in DC, before I had to do that scene, I had went through a, a, a real life moment where a friend of mine had been killed, you know, prior to me filming that actual scene, you know, and I, I woke up, I never forget, I was crying real bad. I looked at the news and, and then a week later, I had to do the scene where I had to kill Michael B. Jordan. So a lot of my emotions that you've seen were, were real. You know, those were real life emotions that, that you've seen, me crying and, and all of that. You know, I just had to take all of that into consideration to, to bring that character, you know, to, to make people feel what I felt shooting it. Yeah, that, so that was real tough. And that, again, kind of lends itself to the authenticity of The Wire. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, to speak to you about, it's one of the very first things that you said about The Wire when we spoke in this interview, was, was Baltimore itself. Now, I always say to people, and I don't know if you'd agree with me, if you disagree, then I certainly take your opinion, but I always say to people that The Wire only has one main character. The main character, in my opinion, is Baltimore. Yeah. That, that's how I perceive the show. Um, explain to me the significance of Baltimore to the people who are in the show and how how you have to kind of to really immerse yourself in the nooks and crannies and, and, and the detail of Baltimore itself to get that authenticity throughout all five seasons. Yeah, well, Baltimore is definitely a special place. I love Baltimore. I lived in, like I said, Forestville, Maryland, right outside of Washington, D.C. So, what, 30, 30 40 minutes from Baltimore. Um, the way that they embraced us, you know, uh, I know first season they had to, you know, talk to some of the real life folks that was out there on the streets, you know, because, I mean, we were shooting in their territory where they were actually selling drugs at every night, you know, I mean, where they were doing business and making things happen, you know, so they had to holler at some of those guys out there like, look, this is the show we shoot. But, you know, as the time went on, you know, we got tight with those brothers, man. We got tight with those guys and. Baltimore is a very special and significant place because, you know, with the wire show was the side of the streets, right? You know, they, 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 they showed that side of it, but at the same time, Baltimore, that, that's Baltimore is a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. You know, it's some places in Baltimore that you can go in. And I mean, you, you, you got certain sides to each city and state all over the world. And Baltimore was that. And then the culture, you know, Baltimore for me, it's like, I've never been to another place like it. You know, it's like, like DC, you never been to another place like it for real. You know, they got their own slang. They got their own lingo. They got their own way of doing things. And, and just for the wire to be depicted out there, you know, for, for what it showed you know, with, with some of the people, you know, some of the real life characters were going through living there all of those years. It's just a beautiful thing, man, to, to watch it unfold. Um, the city itself, you know, they, they may have had a problem with some of the things that was coming out in the show, you know, with the mayor and, you know, the education system and stuff. But, but, the, but, but, you know, one thing for me, people, sometimes people are scared of the truth. You know, when you tell the truth so much, people are, People have a problem with that, but as you grow and you get to appreciate what the wire meant to Baltimore, that's when you start having a better understanding of how much you love what you did see. At least we told the truth, you know? We told the truth on all different aspects. And now I think, like I said, with the years later on, you can see that Baltimore city is one of those cities where it's iconic. You know, you're always, when you think of the wire, you think of Baltimore. When you think of Baltimore, you think of the wire. And that and, and that's that's what it was supposed to do. 
staying with kind of the theme of authenticity throughout the wire one of the things that i um, always explain to people because i'm forever recommending people to watch the wire is the fact that it wasn't created by you know two hollywood film script guys or people who are necessarily you know interested in writing stories about about tv or writing stories for tv ed burns and david simon simon you know cops journalists you know people who weren't yeah. necessarily looking to make something shock worthy how important do you think that is and, and having those guys as, as the people who spearheaded a project like that well it, it was very important because you know ed burns david simon they 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 know it you know they actually knew it they did you didn't you didn't have to be a a hollywood exec to 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 know what those guys wrote you know i mean they embodied those characters man they they, they brought those characters to life they knew some of the real life characters, um, you know, David working in journalism and, 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 and Ed, you know, working with the cop, you know, as a cop, you know, they, those, those guys knew what they were writing. They knew what they were writing was special. And, and that goes back to the point where you were talking about the authenticity. People, people knew that the wire was real. That, that was, that was, that was real life, you know? So it's, um, beautiful how that they were able to like like you stated come from where they come from and were able to put together what they put together when it came to the wire you know like you said this this couldn't have been no other hollywood exec that thought that they knew you know that you know because sometimes you get that a lot you get hollywood execs that write things that they never even maybe stepped a foot in in on, on a in the trap, you know what I'm saying? Like we call it. Like you never step, you never been in a trap house before. You never shot a gun. You you never, you know what I'm saying? You don't know what it's like to to see young black kids running around and they don't got their mother or father. But you but but writing that to a certain extent, David Simon and Ed Burr, they they know they knew they knew what that was. You know, they sat with the families. They, you know, I remember when they did the corner. You know, Fran Boy, that's still a, a good friend of mine to this day. You know, her her son Derod and you know her family. And you know, I mean, they they know them. That's like me writing a story about you after I get to know you for a certain amount of years and I know everything about, you know, your 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 family history, your kids, your 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 girl, your 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 father, your mother. If I write that, that's because I know it. You know, so I think that's how. The wire was able to get formed by guys like David Simon and A. Burns. And, you and George Pelicanos. George Pelicanos, too. I can't forget about him. That's that's a good guy. You know, these guys are great people. You mentioned the, the characters, and and again, there are so many characters in the wire. It's, it's difficult to explain to somebody. As I say, I, I, I can't ever uh, tell somebody that there is a main character because there are so many different pockets of characters and everybody has their own unique way of interacting within the world. Which characters were your favorites? And you're not allowed to say Poot. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> Jamie Hector. Jamie Hector, who played Marlo. Favorite. Wood Harris, Avon Barksdale. Favorite. To be honest, you know what? Michael K. Williams, Omar. Favorite. Yeah. I mean, the way he did that, I mean, that was, I mean, this guy showing up with a shotgun in, in the hood. I mean, and then, you know, for him to, you know, be portraying the role of, of, of a gay man and and still having people fear him for what he's he's coming to do. It's like, yo, this is, I mean, man, you got me thinking back on all of these characters. Every character to me was, was it was something about every single character. Um, Dominique West, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, McNulty, man. Come on, man. Like those are, those were, you know, those lines were just, that was different. You know, Herc and Carver, those, those guys, I think, you know, us <laughs> doing that movie theater scene or whatever, that, those, th th those were, those were iconic moments, you know, that people will never forget, you know? And again, we're kind of touching on what we spoke about at the start with regards to characters. You mentioned Omar, Michael K. Williams, and and the fact that, you know, he is this ferocious man, but he's also a gay man, but he's, you know, he's not, he's not embarrassed by that. You kind of, even, you know, 
you immediately accept that about him but he's also you know he doesn't curse he he wants to look after his grandma and take her to church on a sunday and it's yeah. it allows that different type of nuance and it allows you to understand these three-dimensional characters wow yeah that's true yeah that that's true that's even with um it goes back to michael b jordan mm. you know me and wallace taking care of kids in the row houses like you know we had we had we had a heart you know so i mean but but it's so it's so crazy because the way the the, the poop even developed to look at him working in the, the shoe store, the Foot Locker, at the end of the season, that was a dynamite story alone, a story arc. You start off one way, your 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 current it's almost like your current situation doesn't dictate the future, you know. Because I start you start off poop starts off is this low level drug dealer, you know, you run the time, you got to kill your own best friend. You're seeing all your friends get murdered and locked up. So it is, you know, it is light on the other end of the tunnel. You come to realize, okay, I'm done. I'm done with, with this turmoil, you know, I'm done with all of these things that that's not bringing nothing positive to my life. So I'm gonna get a regular job and I'm going to turn my life around. That was, you know, I, I couldn't have asked for a better, better ending, you know, and I thought I was going to be one of the ones to get killed or locked up in the show. After I seen, after I seen Michael B. Jordan get killed, then I seen, then I seen Intrazel, but then I seen Bodie. I was like, oh yeah, they get right. Then I seen D'Angelo. I said, yeah, they get right. Kill me. Some, somebody's going to, yeah, they're going to, and then to make it to the end, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of, it's, it's, it's power in the ending, you know? It's a lot of power in ending, you know, um, in order to elevate. Now that I'm thinking about it, Poop's character, in order to elevate the power of ending his previous life with the drugs, the violence, the, the craziness, to turning his life around to getting a regular job, that's power, that's, that's elevation now. Now it's time to elevate into something else. I pray that the wire would at least come back for a sixth season. I, I I would love for that story to continue. Like Poop has a job, he got a family now, he got a wife and kid, and he still got one foot in the streets because he's like an OG. And you know, like that would be amazing. Like if, if that was to happen. Somebody tell David Simon, please do that. You know, that that that'd be amazing. David is the guy. You know, I always reach out to him. You know what I'm saying? But who knows, man? Uh, you mentioned that I was going to come on to kind of Poop being one of the one of the success stories from The Wire. You mentioned the, the, all of the turmoil that he goes through in the in the early stages. I think it's fair to say that he's quite an immature character at the start. He's more interested in the yeah. females as the opposed women. to anything else. <laughs> um, but he goes full circle and and he really does end as one of the um, one of the few. It has to be said, one of the few success stories of The Wire is Poop Malik Carr, your character. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and, and it wasn't it's playing that way. I wasn't supposed to be in the show. Like I said, the first season, I thought that was it. But then they, they end up writing me in. They kept writing me in. They kept bringing me back. They kept, they kept giving, this, they kept giving this, this character or the story arc. They kept, um, they just, I just, I just, I'll never, I'll never be able to, you know, tell them how much, like, like they've really, the wire, the wire changed my life. It really did. It changed my life to this day. I just came back from, um, I'm filming something now, like I said, but people, people on set to like, they're, they're talking to me like you talk. They're like, yo, so the wire was, how is it? You know, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm in another character mindset right now. I can't talk about that, but I'm like, yo, forever. You know, the, the wire is forever. It, it'd be it'd be around it it'll always be something that's a part of history and i'm just i'm i'm thankful to be a part of it now we don't as the audience get to see what it is what the the eventual kicker is for poot to leave the game and and go to work in a foot locker or go and work in a you know a shoe store i know as an actor that you would have made that choice or you'd have certainly thought about what it was that that took you out of the game and, and took you into the shoe store what was it was it Bodie's death yeah it was a, it was a combination of everything it was a combination of both. Bodhi's death was the 
that was the end. That was that was the that was the ending, you know, of of the the years of just being in the streets and and having to find his own way. And you know, that that was the ending for for Pooh. And then, you know, I, I mean, because Bodie's death, you gotta think about the flashbacks of Wallace's death. Lil Kevin. You gotta think about all the flashbacks of everybody, you know, all Avon and and we they getting locked up. You gotta think about who who else does Pooh have? He's not gonna go to Marlo's crew. <laughs> You know, I mean, you know, it's that was the ending. That was the ending. That's what that's what turned him around. Now you mentioned beforehand, you mentioned the two kind of the kings of the West Side in Avon and Marlowe, two polar opposite characters. And now I feel like this is something that that The Wire does fantastically well, almost well better than any other TV show is 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 showing the kind of the development and the evolution not only of, of the wire or Baltimore or the drug trade, but but human life and existence. And you have I mean, hold on. Let me. See You're okay. <laughs> no, I had to. I had to. That, that's that was them reaching out. What time is it? <laughs> I, 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 we're we're almost done. We'll okay. Wrap it. So it's it'll be ten past eleven your time. Okay. Cool. Okay. No, no, you good. Yeah, you good. We'll get there. Um. Yeah, as, as I mentioned, The Wire, more than, more than any other TV show I've ever watched, really does show the evolution of, of human nature and the evolution of, of the next wave. I mean, you have that that brilliant scene with uh, Herc and Carver where you say, oh, everybody says this. The next year, it's the crack baby's babies out here. But it really... <laughs> But it really does show that. And I feel like there, there's there's a, a brilliant example of that in Avon and Marlowe's characters. The fact that Avon is a very passionate, very, you know, he's he's very much, he cares about what people think about his reputation, even if he would never admit it. Whereas Marlowe, yeah. very, very cold king, kingpin character. We only really see that one flash of emotion when he's holding court in the cell. Um, just explain the difference between those two and which one, if you could pick, were your favorite. Um, well, see, that's hard because Avon, you know, Avon was on it. Avon had his mission and, and Marlo had his mission. And, and those those two beautifully crafted characters that David created was just, you know, with, with them going head to head against each other, it was almost like, who would I say? I gotta go with Avon, man. I gotta go with the home team. Yeah, but I love, I loved Marlo. I love Marlo Stansfield. That I, I love Marlo Stansfield because of his, his poise and his um. He, he's like a no nonsense type of guy. You know what I'm saying? No nonsense. And um. But Avon was the boss. You know, he was he was he was the head of the the Barksdale Crew organization, even down to his sister. You know, and D'Angelo being his nephew, that 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 was crazy. You know, I think one one of my favorite ever scenes was when they they meet when they come face to face when Marlo goes to Jessup and he's trying to get with Sergey and then they finally meet and then you get to see that it's also almost like a kind of a passing of the torch. They both understand each other. It feels like even if they are quite different. That's true. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you on that. Right. You have to get back to work. So I've got a couple of quick questions. One question. So my favorite scene that involves you is with one of our own, Idris Elba, um, product, the product meeting, the infamous <laughs> product meeting. Now, going back and looking at that, you don't have many lines. You only have one line, but you are a, a prominent feature throughout that scene. Just explain to us what's going on in that scene and what goes through your mind as poop because as i mentioned you don't say a lot but your face your reactions kind of what we know about poop really does inform us of what's going on in that situation yeah um that scene was poop having his own thoughts but knowing he couldn't present his own thoughts until he did and then stringer bell gets pissed off but um Man, it's so much power and dynamic in that scene because, you know, working with Idris Elba, who, who's a who's a great guy, man. He, I appreciate him because he did a drop for me on my uh, my new documentary that's coming out. But he's um, you know, he he's he's in charge. You know, he's he's the guy that's in charge. And uh, I think what was going through Pooh's mind was, you know, how they wasn't going to look too tough, you know, on the streets, you know, and um, 
you know, that that whole dynamic of that scene, it just, it played out perfect, you know, because at, at, I know a couple of, I want to say season two, it almost, it almost, I know that was in, you know, the, the first season, but I know when, um, when Poop was able to take over the towers, when he had like his own tower, it almost made sense to have that scene where I was sitting there as one of the guys that was paying attention. And then next thing you know, I get my own little click in my own little crew of towers or whatever and i'm trying to discuss to them what what needs to be done so i think um man it was elba that's yeah that, that that was another one you you're 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 reminding me of all of these 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 amazing scenes that's why i'm going over these words like this well, I'm very, very happy to to remind you of them, and I really could speak all day to you um, as as yourself and to you as a as an ex member of the greatest TV show of all time, The Wire. I will leave the final word with you. What message have you got for fans who, like me, are still enormous fans of The Wire, almost twenty years later? Um, what message have you got for them, and what message have you got for people? who will be hopefully tuning in to watch your short film next week on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Um, my message, man, is just, um, I appreciate you all. I'm grateful. I'm thankful for all of the fans out there. Uh, thank you, Rob, for, you know, taking this time to, to talk to me about one of the greatest shows that ever hit television, The Wire. And um, just, I'm praying for everybody. You know, I'm praying that everybody, I'm praying for peace, you know, to, to be amongst everybody, man, and, and just whatever you want to do in life, keep striving for your dreams. Don't ever give up. Just just continue to push forward. You know, as much as these distractions this this coming into this coming to us and surrounding the world, just keep pushing forward and and, and just know that it is light on the the other end of the the tunnel. You know class act trey cheney thank you very much for speaking to me before i let you go i wouldn't forgive myself if i didn't ask where i could get one of those hoodies i need one of those hoodies show us the hoodies and tell the, us where we the can wire hoodies. Hoodies. <laughs> <laughs> so no this is what you do i have a website the website is tradescurriculum.com i'll get you to post it i'm giving out the wire hoodies for free actually when people say if they go and they buy two shirts and a book from my website You'll, you'll get the, the wire hoodie for free. Just go to my website, tracecurriculum.com. The link is in my bio on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, Instagram, too. My Instagram is at Dedicated Father Series page. I mean, it's a long word, but, you know, you look up Trey Chaney, you'll see Dedicated Father Series page. And um, like I said, go to the site, buy two shirts and a book, and you get the, the wire hoodie for free. That's I'll how we're we going to do that. <laughs> you got some boxing questions for me, man, before I go? so you can I've got some that. boxing questions. I'm wrapping up the wire one first, and then we're going to have some boxing ones, okay? All right, cool. Yeah, okay. I got you. Okay, well, Trey Chaney, a.k.a. Poop from the Wire, plus a whole host of other characters that we look forward to seeing, not only in the next week, but in the coming years. Thank you so much for speaking to me and being my first interview with somebody who isn't a fighter or in boxing. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope people have enjoyed this, um, and I hope to hopefully catch up with you another time yes mm -hmm.